All right, it's time for us to start. Good quality group of people here. Thank you so much for coming. Bruce is going to have some announcements, and then we're going to go from there and try to improve our Christian living, if at all possible. I had some uh, people to add to the prayer list this evening, so I was going to go ahead and do them from up here. Uh, as we know, on the 3rd, Gary will have his PET scan, so we want to pray for him that everything goes well with that and he gets a good report. We also want to remember Marilyn and her family and the loss of Leroy Hamby. Uh, passed away yesterday, and uh, so we want to keep that family in our prayers. Um, also, Jessica Reinhardt will have another scan on her uh, cancer tumor and... Uh, coming up, I believe, the first of next week. So keep her in mind. That will determine if they can take the tumor out, if it's shrunk. Also, her father, Ricky Glover, has a mass in his colon, I believe, or around his colon, and he's going to have a scan on that coming up next week. And a lady that works with Ashley up at the nursing home, Bonnie M Moyer, has a med tech coming up in a few days, so she has to be on her prayer list. So remember those, and... Uh, all those we have on our regular prayer list, we want to remember them as well. So that's all I have, Gary. Okay. Any other announcements from the before we get, begin Amen. with the prayer? All right, I thought for tonight, I thought, how in the world can we improve our Christian living? You know, if we're living as a Christian, uh, we're living the best, I guess, we can, but there may be some room for improvement. Do y'all think that might be a a, a, an avenue to take I think all of us probably could look at some things in the Bible in retrospect that we may do a lot of it but we may not do all of it and there may be some of those things that we just every once in a while we just sort of neglect you know I, I've been guilty of that myself neglect that means maybe I don't call people like I should maybe I don't invite people like I should or, or maybe I I just neglect to, to go out of my way to make uh, somebody feel a little better about their situation, you know, maybe with a prayer or something. But I wanted tonight to look at some of the things that I think will help us to improve our Christian living. Now, from the standpoint of what the Bible teaches, there's all kind of things we need to do and all kind of things we don't need to do, okay? Uh, I guess most of us could agree with this. We might have done something we didn't need to do, right? But on the other side of that coin, we may need to do something that we hadn't done, you know, uh, in, in thoughts. So let's, let's look at some of the things in the Bible that, that would help us along the way, I think. Go to the book of 1 Thessalonians. This will be chapter number 3. No, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, I'm sorry. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I will be using some out of 3, but I'm going to go to chapter 4 of the book of 1 Thessalonians. I'm going to be looking at verse 9, 10, 11, and 12. This is a pretty good reading here that we're going to be looking at first. Uh, this will be verses 9, 10, 11, and 12, 1 Thessalonians 4. Terry, you start that, please. But as touching brotherly love, you need not that I write unto you, for you, ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another, and indeed you do, and toward all the brethren which are all Macedonia, but yes. we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more, and that we ye study to be quiet and to do your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. Think ye may walk honestly toward them that are without, and that ye may have lack of nothing. Now, there's a host of things. I could preach an entire sermon on this very reading that we just read. But let's look at it from the standpoint, he says, it's touching brotherly love. You need not that I write unto you, for you yourselves are taught of God to love one another. Now, first of all, to improve our Christian living, I think we need to express more so than ever before our feelings toward each other. Now, if you don't like me, uh, that's one way. But, you know, if we care for somebody, what's wrong with expressing our feelings toward one another? You know, if you love me, I love you. I don't mind to say I love you, you know. 
And I think that's one of the things missing because, I mean, Scott, kind of like Vicky and I were talking about this morning, we, you know, even married couples, sometimes they go for days and never mention that they have feelings one for another, that they love each other, you know. And Christians are no different. I mean, I mean the marital uh, status is one thing, but Christian brotherly love, I mean, you know, that's something that we need to express more so than ever before. I think people have, I don't know why people are not coming. People have, I don't know. I mean, I, I've talked to some of the other brothers in other places, and some of them are experiencing the same things that we are. People just not motivated. Well, one of the things I think will motivate us more so ever, than ever before is that if we learn the true feelings one for another, if we learn how to express those feelings and say, hey, man, I love you, or, or I love you, and, and I want you to love me. But we have to, we have to express those feelings and show those feelings. Now, saying I love you sometimes just don't get it. You know the best way to show somebody that you love them is with action, you know, to express gratitude, to encourage. I mean, how many of us likes encouragement? Most all of us do, don't we? We like encouragement. We like for somebody to say, hey, you did a good job, or you, you look good today, or you're doing this, or you're doing that. Encouragement goes a long way. But I think expressing our love one for another, now that's what the Bible teaches. This is not just something I thought up. He said, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. That's, that's what makes a church strong. That's what makes a church grow. That's what makes a church like it should be. Now, the other part of this he says that you do it toward all the brethren, he said, which are in Macedonia, but we beseech you, brethren, that you increase more and more. Well, look at the part that says increase more and more. The longer we're together, the closer we should be. The longer we're together, the more that we should love each other more. You know, if you learn the habits of one another, you learn the, the, the situation with your family, as a lot, a lot of us know the situation with each family, you know. Uh, we know what goes on with the family, if they're sick, if they need help, whatever. All those things matter a great deal. And so whenever we express ourselves to love each other, we show it. And we show it by the actions and the ways that we, we challenge ourselves. Now, as we go on, as he read there, that you study to be quiet, do your own business, to work with your own hands as we commanded you. Now, we can express to each other, we can talk to each other, we can love each other, but you know your business is your business and my business is my business, right? I mean, that's the way it should be for all of us. You know, some families really and truly can't get along. You know why they can't get along? Because somebody somewhere is not minding their own business. They're trying to mind everybody else's business in families, in churches, you know. It, it's important that we take care of ourselves before we express taking care of others. Minding our own business, you know. It's all right to ask questions. It's all right to, to talk to each other about personal matters and things of that nature. I've been in the ministry a long time, you know, probably too long, as a lot of people say. But I've learned something. You know, if you need my help, if you need me to talk to, I'm there and I'm available. You know, and it's important, but it's, it needs to be that I don't get to a point where I meddle. You know, if I'm there and you want to talk to me, that's good. I'll talk with you. But I don't need to meddle in your business. Your business is your business. And if you want me in your business, I'd be glad to help you as best I can. But I can't go there without your encouragement or your asking or, or something like that. You know, a lot of times, and I've said this a lot of times, when I was in business, you know, and I, I, I was pretty decently successful in some of the things, that, some of the endeavors that I did, but a lot of times, you know, you have to be private about certain things, you know, and you have to mind your own business, but you also have to be that person that is careful not to try to mind somebody else's business. And, you know, I figure it this way. If you want me to know something, you'll tell me without me asking. Now, sometimes I may have to ask. Sometimes you may have to ask. But from the standpoint of minding our own business, that's a part of being a good Christian is learning to mind our own business 
you know. And he talks about being quiet, minding your own business. Now, the other part of this is honesty. Honesty. And if I've ever learned anything in my life in the 70 years that I've been on this earth, this is what I've learned. Everybody's not honest. Y'all believe that? Everybody's not honest. And when it comes to money, you find more and more of the dishonesty of people. You know, it's amazing to me at the, at, at the people that sit and wait on somebody to die so they can have what they got. And they didn't work for it. They didn't do nothing for it. Oh, but they, they feel entitled, you know. That's, that's a sad thing. It, it, it shouldn't be that way. Now, that's a part of what we're talking about, that you may walk honestly toward them that are without and that you may have lack of nothing. I think it, it makes a difference how we, how we go about our fellow man, you know, uh, how we go about within our own family unit. You know, uh, I've talked to a lot of people, you know, families break apart over things sometimes it's not worth nothing. Y'all ever thought about that? I know a brother and sister, and y'all have heard me tell this before, they didn't speak to each other for 20 years on account of an old car that was done wore out. I'm talking about a car wasn't worth $400. But a brother and sister, because daddy died, one of them wanted it and the other one got it, and they didn't speak to each other for 20 years. I mean, that just don't make no sense to me. I mean, and we're talking about things that would improve our Christian living. That, to me, doesn't, it, that doesn't lend itself to what a Christian ought to be. I mean, my goodness. I mean, it, it should be that we, we learn these principles. Now, that's the start. Let's go to something else here. Lack of nothing. <laughs> you don't have to be wanting what somebody else has got. If you mind your own business and work, you'll have, you have lack of nothing. Okay, let's look at another thing here. And one of the most, I guess, one of the worst things, I guess, could ever be to me is flat-out lying, you know, from the standpoint of, you know, you ask somebody something and you expect to get the truth, you know, if they're going to tell you. And then they tell you something, and you know good and well that's not the truth. If we're looking in, in the passages, it's Colossians chapter 3. We'll look at verse number 9. We may go a long way in Colossians chapter 3, but let's go to verse number 9. Colossians chapter 3, verse number 9. I'm coming to my right-hand side. Linda, you're in the back. If you don't mind, get that one for us. Why not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds? Okay, I think in our society today, and, and I'm not going into politics, but I, I'm, I'm going to tell you, I think in our society today it's worse in, in my lifetime than it's ever been as far as lying. You know, our society is built, a lot of our society is built on lies. And a lot of the things that are governing us is built on lies. And a lot of the things that, that they even moves into the church sometimes. It's built on lies. And he says, lie not one to another. Well, you know, I've thought a lot about it. And, you know, most all of us have been guilty of this at one time or another. You know, uh, uh, if I say, anybody in here ever told a lie and nobody raised their hand, uh, you know, <laughs> you <lied. laughs> that's right, you'd be lied, wouldn't you? Well, you know, Bible study should be one of those things where we can all understand what we're, where we're at with it. Lie not one to another. If you ask me something, and I know that if I'm going to tell you the truth, it ain't going to set well, I just well keep my mouth shut. All right, I'm going to tell you, well, you want me to lie to you, and in that way you'll know that I need to keep my mouth shut. You know, this, that's really and truly, this is part of living as a Christian. If, if you're going to live as a Christian, you've got to learn the principles of truth. You know, and, and how damaging a lie can be. And I'm telling you, a lie, can, a lie has started wars. A lie has caused people to lose their lives. A lie has a lot of times caused major problems in families. You know, lie is a, is a dangerous thing. And, you know, there's so much. You look at the book of James and talk about the tongue, and you, you, you look at how damaging it can be. You know, it's a little bitty thing, but it's a 
to control it, it takes a lot. So he says, lie not one to another, and why? He said, seeing that you put off the old man with his deeds. When we become a Christian, and that's what the, the, my lesson title is tonight, improving our Christian living. This is one way we can do that. Make sure that if we've got to talk and we've got to answer or we've got a question or whatever, let's be careful with, what, with how we do it. Lie not one to another, seeing that you've put off the old man with his deeds. I think there's a lot to be said about verse number 12 in this same chapter uh, in Colossians chapter number 3, verse number 12. Bobby, you want to pick that up for us? For as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering. Go ahead and read 13 too. Bearing with one another and forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. Boy, there's a host of things right here that would improve our Christian living. Now, first of all, when he talks about putting on the elect of God, holy bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, and long-suffering. You know, that's how we should live our lives. That, that's the best way to live our lives. I mean, we, we keep ourselves out of trouble if, we, if we're merciful. We keep ourselves out of trouble if we're kind. We keep ourselves out of, out of trouble if we're long-suffering. And, you know, all these things here has a, a big bearing on, on living as a Christian. Now, the last part of this has the forgiving thing. And, you know, that's one of the things that I've preached many a sermon on over the course of my 40 years in the ministry. Forgiveness. You know, that's something that really and truly we have to, we have to build ourselves into a situation where we can be a forgiving person. Because not, not every time that we say we forgive you, we forget you, you know? I've had a lot of times in, in life that I've heard people tell somebody, well, I forgive you. And you know just as well in the way that they said it and the look in their eye and the way that their mannerism was, they didn't forgive it. They, they, they just said it to kind of make it seem a little better, but they didn't do it. You know, everything changes about you if you really and truly have that forgiveness. Everything changes about you. Your look, you know, your mannerism, your, your tone of voice. I mean, everything. When you actually forgive somebody something, then you go back to this humbleness of mind and bowels of mercy and all that stuff. Y'all agree? I mean, forgiveness is a, one of the hardest things in the world for a lot of people. You know, many a marriage is broke apart because there can't be any forgiveness. You know, many a family has busted apart. Family units have gone apart because there couldn't be any forgiveness. You know, just couldn't manage it. And I thought about, you know, how do we deal with something that's so powerful, forgiveness? The best way I know to deal with it is to think about how we obtain forgiveness. It came at an awful, awful price. I mean, it was a big price. You know, the Son of God died so that we could obtain forgiveness, you know. And I think sometimes if we have to sacrifice to forgive, y'all may or may not agree with me on this, and if you don't, speak up, and if you do, speak up. But, you know, we may have to, we may have to sacrifice sometimes to forgive. Y'all believe that? Well, I've had people come to me years ago, you know, and they'd say, well, you know, so-and-so made a mistake. And what do I need to do about it? I said, you need to forgive them. Well, I can't. I can't do that. You know? So why not? Because, I mean, think about it. You know, they did this. They did that. You know, mistakes are made every day. You know, people make bad decisions every day of their life. You know, when I say that, people look, you know, they got real upset when I was teaching a class one time up there at Pinball, and I said, People make mistakes every day, and sometimes, you know, people don't recognize the mistake till it's too late, you know. And, you know, they, they got all bent out of shape. They say, you know, no, I don't make mistakes every day. You know, sometimes we do things that we just really and truly haven't thought much about, and, and we make a mistake, you know. There's two ways to, to handle that. You know, if you make a mistake, that means that you didn't really have an intent. It just happened, and you did it. 
and you made a mistake. Well, I can understand that. But in, when you purposely do something, that's a whole lot different. But even in the purposely doing, Kathy, I, I will say this. Sometimes when people, that's just like confessing. You know, when somebody walks down the aisle and they say, you know, I've sinned. You know, they don't, I don't think anybody ought to say if I've sinned. They know if whether or not they have. But if they come forward and they say, I've sinned, and I've fallen short of the glory of God, I, I need to repent, okay? That means that they've done something. I don't know whether they did it mistakenly or as they've done it on purpose, but that puts you into a situation where we're going to have to measure up to the forgiveness aspect. We have to move along with that. Now, I understand where you're coming from because I've, I've had a problem with that for a long time too uh, because I have family members that really and truly, they, they just will not change their their habits, and, you know, and it bothers me. And I get on to them, you know, and they say, well, you've got to forgive me of it. I, I say, no, I don't have to forgive you of it until you get rid of it, you know. You've got to get rid of it. So there's a thing that, there's a thing about this. It improves our Christian living when we can. Anybody ever made forgiveness and you felt a difference in your body, in your mind, and in your heart? But I know what Kathy's talking about. It's, it's a difficult, difficult thing. But it, it's something that I think we're trying to improve our Christian living. I think for us sometimes when we harbor those feelings, it doesn't hurt that aspect over yonder. You know where it hurts. It hurts this aspect over here. That's, that's the worst thing about it. And, and you have to live with that, and, and it's tough. It's tough. I've, I've been in some, some situations where I've had to talk to people about things that I don't think I could have ever forgotten. You know, uh, somebody come to you about a situation and they say, you know, I know i got to manage this forgiveness. I need to talk to you. And, and we'll go into that situation about forgiveness and trying to forget. But there I am sitting there that I can tell them they need to forget it. But if I was on their side of the track, I don't know that I could either. You know, that's, that's just it. But I know God's intent. God's intent. Because when you look at the way the Lord does this, he forgives and he doesn't keep it to your charge anymore. It's gone, you know. So evidently, he may remember, but he's, he doesn't keep it to your charge. You know, it's gone, you know. And that's what's important. Any other thoughts or comments? My thing is, I, I forgive, and I forget it, and then they do something to <clears throat> aggravate me, stir it up, and then it comes back to my mind. I try to forget all the things that, you know, have been done, and I try not to dwell on it, but it's hard when... It's one know. of the hardest subjects. I mean, it's one of the hardest things in the whole Christian living atmosphere is forgiveness, you know. And we all need it, and we all need to be able to, to manage it in our lives, but it's one, it's, it's one of the toughest things that's out there, uh, I don't know how to give you any more information. Uh, if you look at the Bible, you study the Bible, and you keep your mind and, and, and you keep focused on these things, you have to say and you have to teach it that forgiveness is one of those things where we must manage it. We have to do it. But I don't know how to tell you about the forgetting aspect. Well, you're trying to do right, and you're trying to, you forgave, and you're trying to forget it. The devil knows that you're trying to do right, so the devil's going to slip in a little thought, you know. That's the way I look at it. Hey, don't you know, keep... Because then on my feet, I have to say, get behind me, Satan. You know, because you say, you know, and I'll do stuff like that too, you know, because I know it's the old devil trying to get me to mess up. He's going to keep digging on you, that's for sure. Uh, there are certain things in life that is almost, I say, not even human that people... I mean, forgiveness. I mean, if you think about the aspect of some of the things that we've learned recently that happens in wars and stuff like that, I don't know how you manage those things. Uh, I know you have to. Uh, you know, that's something that you have to do, but it's a, it's a tough thing. So I don't have all the answers to that, but I, I know that this is we're trying to improve our Christian living, and one of the ways that we improve our Christian living is do the best we can to manage forgiveness as much as we can, you know. Now, here's one that 
I wish I could manage this one too, but I, I can't. Let's go to Philippians chapter 2, verse number 14. Kathy, I'm going to get you to read this one. Maybe this won't be so hard. Philippians 2, verse number 14. Do all things without murmurings, murmurings, and disputings. Okay. <laughs> Y'all know how hard that is. <laughs> Do all things without murmuring and disputing. Anybody ever get in a fuss? Surely not. Ain't nobody in this room ever getting a fuss, right? <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> used to be when I stayed with my granddaddy every summer and worked up here as a lifeguard, he, he'd say, he'd tell me things to do. And I'd fuss about it. And he said, son, you're supposed to do all things without <laughs> complaining and murmuring. Go on and do it, you know. And I, I'd, I'd fuss about it, you know, if it was doing something I didn't. But, you know, this is one of the things that I think Christian living would be better for us all. If we could manage a little more, I guess, integrity with murmuring and complaining, you know. I get tired of cutting grass, you know, and I complain about it all the time. But there ain't no reason to complain about it because it's going to rain. It's going to grow right back. So just, well, go ahead and do it. And don't complain about it. Murmuring, you know, fussing about it. It ain't going to matter. Floor needs sweeping, sweep the floor. Don't fuss about it, just sweep the floor. Dishes need washing, just go on over there and get the sink and wash the dishes. You know, it ain't gonna quit, it ain't gonna go away until you do it. That's no, where the <laughs> that's where the dispute is. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I found out it's better just to get up, not say a word, and go ahead and do whatever you need to do and get it done and get it over with. You know, I mean, in, in a relationship, you know, in, in a marital relationship, there are certain things that you need to do and don't complain about. It. I mean, I, I think about little things that people don't, you know, I mean, I don't know about y'all, but, you know, some people have, they have extraordinary habits, you know, they like cleaning the commodes and stuff like that, you know. Uh, that's something on a daily basis that, you know, around my house, it, it, you just clean. It don't matter if it's dirty or what. You just do it, you know. you know, That's just certain things. And I'm just saying, you know, just, well, do them, not complain about them. Just go ahead and do it. Get it over with and get it done, you know. And I think that's one of the things with improving your Christian living. You know, things are a lot better with every type of relationship if you can do these things without murmuring and complaining. You know, because that way you don't really start, you don't have the strife, you don't have the problems. If you just do it and go on about your business, you know, get it done. And, and this is what I think about Christian living. That some of these things are, are just basic things that, that makes our lives better. And I'm serious with you, that makes our lives better. Philippians 2 and verse number 3, Michelle. Let nothing be done through strive or vain glory, but in loveliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. <coughs> okay, now this is a hard one for y'all. How do we look at this? He says, don't do it through strife or vain glory, but in loneliness of mind, esteem others better than themselves. Now, how do we do that? Let, let's say, you know, how do we esteem others better than ourselves in a situation like this? You know, I mean, this is, this is a tough one right here. You think about it. Let, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. What's vain glory? Taking the credit for it, right? Vain glory. I, I guess this is one of the things that always bothered me. Somebody's telling you something, and before they can get it out of their mouth, what they're trying to tell you, you're telling them something, and you're beating their story. Y'all ever had that happen to you, you know? I mean, vain glory is whenever you try to outdo or, or get beyond what's normal. And strife means, you know, you're going to do it, but you're going to cause problems when you do it, you know? And a lot of times people fuss about anything. I mean, it, strife is, is one of those things. He said, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. If I don't get the dishes clean, go back and clean them again and just keep your mouth shut. Right, Bruce? 
That's what you do. No, seriously, I mean, as a Christian, these things here do matter. He said, in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. I don't know how, how you're going to manage this one, but I think in lowliness of mind is if you do it good one time, you may not do it as good the next time. And somebody else may come along and they can actually do it better. And, you know, <clears throat> it's almost a given. Most people have this sense of, let's see, what's that word? I think it's jealousy or envy. You know, if you can do something, you may do it really good. You may be sure enough good at it, but rest assured now that somebody can do it better. Now, I'm serious with you. It don't matter. I mean, I found that out myself the hard way. I mean, you can do something so good that it's almost to perfection, but guess what? Along comes this one, and they can do it perfect, you know. Let each esteem others better than themselves. Maybe we know we can do something really good, but there may be somebody out there can do better than we can do. You know. It's kind of like, you know, people bragging on preachers. Some people, no doubt, are absolutely excellent. I mean, if y'all ever heard that fella, that black fella that comes to Piedmont, you know, I don't know too many people can carry that much weight and, and do what he does, but he's good. You know, I mean, he's good. But you know what? They may be somebody out there better. You know, it's almost a given that, that what we're talking about here, if we just esteem others better than ourselves, I know, you know, I'm not here. And, and that's where you've got to give, you got to give merit to where you're at in life. You know, I've had certain things that people had to teach me how to do. Well, how you handle being taught how to do something makes all the difference in the world. Kind of goes back to what you're talking about. You know, if you're the person that thinks you know already, you're not going to learn too much because you're going to be thinking in your mind, you know, I can already do this or I can do this or this way and I can do this that way. But if you get it to a point where this person's teaching you how to do it, they may do it a different way. They may do it completely opposite and you may think you have the best way, but when you really look at it and you really examine what's being taught to you, you may very well find a better way. You know, I've learned things like that uh, over the course of time. If you just give your stuff, he said, let, let each esteem others better than themselves. Think about it. There may be something they know I don't know. There may be something they could do I can't do, and they can do it so much better than I could ever do. And that's what's so important, is learning how to handle those things as a Christian. You know, people, you know, I... I guess a good listener would be how you would define this one. You know, a person learns a whole lot more if they listen a whole lot more than they talk. Y'all believe that? You know, I told y'all about the fella that told me. I was going down the road talking, running my mouth just like I always do. And, and he said, hey, preacher, you know why God gave a man two ears and one mouth? And everybody started laughing. <laughs> he said, Listen a whole lot more than you talk. In other words, he wanted me to shut up. And, and he was right, you know. That's important. So what we're talking about matters a great deal here. Now, I have utilized this one in such a way that let's go to the book of Galatians, chapter number 6. Chapter number six. This will be verse number 32. Miss Judy, we got you over in the corner. Let's, let's hear from you. Uh, Galatians chapter five. Over there. And this will be verse number 32. What did I call out? Okay. All right. Galatians number. Let me see if I can get it right here. Ephesians, I'm sorry. Look look at me looking above that. I'm going to Galatians chapter 6, but let's go to the book of Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 32. I wanted to kind of concentrate on the kindness aspect of this right here. Be ye kind one to another. You know, 
I've said it a lot of times, you know, I find in our society today, more so than ever before, that there's so much unkindness. Just You, you try to get in a traffic, in, in a line of traffic today and see what goes on. Every once in a while, you'll find that person that'll let you in. But for the most part, they run over you if you're trying to get in the traffic, you know. Try to find that person that will open the door and hold the door open for you, you know, when you're going in and out. Uh, try to find that person that you're asking directions and they, it just overwhelms them, you know. You don't want to fool you, you know. They don't want to take time to stand there and talk to you. Find that person that, you know, see somebody putting their groceries in the car and they stop and help them put them in there, you know. There's all kind of things and, and, and that we just take for granted. But he said, be ye kind one to another. You know, kindness is a, a, you know, it's something that I guess you learn. Because some people, they live their life never, ever being kind. You know. And when I say kind, I mean they don't care. We live in a society today, y'all. People don't care. They really don't. You know, you may ask somebody the other day, I, I, I witnessed this, you know, somebody asked somebody where something was over there at the Dollar Tree. You know, it's about the only place I can shop now. But it was over to Dollar Tree, and this, this lady asked us, and, and, and that person turned around and said, well, I don't know where it's at. You'll just have to look for it. It was an old person, you know. So do you know where the, I forgot what it was she was asking about, but said, no, nah, I don't know where that's at. You'll just have to go look for it. Well, boy, that's something, ain't it? I mean, that's just the way people are today. And that's surely not a Christian way. I see some people, though, Joe, at the grocery store, some old person's headed to the door, and they'll go out of their way to shoot in front of them and get in there and let that door close without stopping. I've seen it a lot of times. And so the other day, you know, I went over there to the grocery store and was going to get something at the deli over there. And this, this guy came in, and he walked up, and this little lady there, and, then two, and an older guy, they was husband and wife, I could tell. They was waiting on their stuff, and this guy just run right in front of him. He said, I'm in a hurry, y'all. If you don't mind, I'm going to go ahead. And, I mean, I thought, I don't care what kind of hurry you're in, you know. Make you want to just knock them out. Well, sure. Yeah. But that, that, that's just not the way people are, you know. And I don't know what's wrong with society that we've reached a point where, and I think a lot of it has to do, they're not godly people. A lot of people are not godly, you know. Uh, I, I seen something else not too long ago. A lady fell at the post office. She fell on the steps there. Guy was coming out. He just walks right on down and gets in his car, you know, and this poor lady's sitting there, you know, rubbing her knee and all that stuff. And I walked up to her, and she said, I don't think I broke my leg. And I said, well, let me help you up. And she said, well, just give me a few minutes. So I sat down beside her, you know, give her a few minutes, you know. And uh, But this guy, he he could have very easily, you know, done stop too, but he just went on, you know, didn't care. He don't care. <laughs> Do what? He may have been. <laughs> he may have been. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't thought about that, Michelle. <laughs> That's probably right. Let's try another one in Galatians 6 before we quit tonight. Let's try number 26. Galatians 6, verse 26. Ephesians, I'm talking about, let me write that down so I'll quit calling that out. Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 26. Gary Anderson you want to read that for us? In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. Read verse 27. See what yours says about that. And do not give the devil a foothold. <laughs> okay. Basically saying the same thing. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Now, how do you get angry and don't sin? You know, that's a hard one, isn't it? The point is, he didn't say don't get angry. No, he didn't say don't get angry. He says, be ye angry and sin not. <laughs> so that means you got to sort of stay in control of that anger. Now, that's a hard matter. That's a hard matter. 
He said, you get angry and you sin not. And he says, and don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Now, that seems like to me, don't let it fester, you know. Just get it, get in and get out. Get over it, you know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I've, I've said this a lot of times, you know, back on time, me, me and my brother got a real whooping from my grandpa. He said, you can get mad, boy, but you better get glad, and you better do it quick because we done got us a pretty good whooping, you know. And he said, you can get mad, but you better get glad real quick. <laughs> Well, you know, I've thought about that a lot of times. You know, this is sort of the principle. He said, you be angry, but don't you sin doing it. He said, you be angry and sin not. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. You get in, you get out. You get over it. Don't give place to the devil. That's the most important part of that verse of Scripture. Don't give place to the devil. You know what the old devil will do? He'd be happy, to, happy that you got mad and you did something crazy. You know, it's just, uh, and you know, there have been a lot of times that people have done things they wished a thousand times. I talked to a man one time that got life in prison for doing something that he, he got mad and he did it. And, and it cost him life in prison. And I, he wrote me a letter about it. And it, that's something that you just, you know, you got to, got to maintain that temper. You know, and I'm, that's the world's worst. You know, there's a lot of us. You know, me and Terry's talked about it. Me, uh, me and Luane's talked about it. You know, you can let you can let your mouth, and you can let your your mannerism and all change. You, you get angry and, and do things you really really wished you hadn't done, but you be angry, but don't let sin come into it, and get over it. You know, that's the main thing. But you know, I, I've seen people, and, and and I've been guilty of it myself. They get angry and get upset and tear up something that they wished a thousand times after they tore it up. They didn't, they, I wish I had never tore that up, you know, because you got to fix it, you know, or either replace it. And people, you know, anger is one of those things, anger management. I don't know how to deal with it, uh, but I'll tell you what, the older I get, the better I get with it. Because you, and Mr. George is shaking his head, but uh, that's the truth. As you get older, George, I believe you do have a better mannerism about being Mad and upset, you know. I love to study things, though, that helps us all to recognize how we can do, do a, and be a better Christian. Just a couple more things here, and then we'll... Anybody got any thought or comment you wanted to say? I don't want to run overrun you. All right, if not, let's look at something else. Let's, let's go to the book of Galatians that I've been trying to get to all night for a minute. Galatians 6, this will be verse number 1, and I think we can manage this one. Pam, I'm going to come over to you on this one. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such as one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, that thou also be tempted. Okay. I'll get to two in a minute, but we'll get somebody else to read that. But I want you to listen to what Pam just read to us there. Being overtaken in a fault. Any of us got any of them things? A fault? We do, don't we? Okay, if you're overtaken in a fault, you've let it take, take control in your life. And he says, if that's the case, then he gives, he gives directions. He said, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. That means... Do it the best you can, as humble as possible. And the way you do that is consider yourself. You might be in the same situation sometime or another, in the same situation that they're in, you know. And, you know, a lot of times what would make you mad might not make me mad, but it might be that what makes you mad might make me mad too, you know. And then whenever you think about this, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you know, that's somebody that let things get out of control and their life was, you know, in jeopardy. You know, that's what we're talking about. He said, ye which are spiritual, you know, restore such a one. <clears throat> you know, none of us are above what we refer to as sin. You know, that's a transgression of the law of God. 
Sin is a transgression of the law of God. That's breaking God's commandments. The Bible says we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And you know, when I see that word all, you know where I'm at in that? I'm right with y'all. And y'all are right with me on that. We all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's not too many of us that reached adulthood and have gone into adulthood and stayed as an adult that hasn't experienced some form of sin in our life. You know, it might be the sin of neglect. It might not be one of those where we grade out to be really bad, but nevertheless, it might be something bad. But sin is something that, that none of us are immune to. And if we're overtaken in it, that means that it has put us in a situation where we are in jeopardy of losing our soul. Now, if that's the case, we've got to have some help. And he said the best help you can have is somebody that's spiritual, somebody that recognizes the fact, and they see it, and they're really willing and able to help in a time of need like that. And, you know, you don't want to meddle in somebody's life, but if you can be of help to that person when it comes to being overtaken in a fall, you've you got to get out there and you've got to do it, you know. And I had a man tell me one time, I was, we, we was looking at this verse of Scripture, and he said, that ain't got nothing to do. He said, that's the elder's job. Yes, it's part of the elder's job. If there's an elder in the church, it's part of his job to help somebody. It's been overtaken in a fault. But I tell you what, you don't have to be an elder to help somebody that's overtaken in a fault. We're talking about ye which are spiritual. That means if you are a Christian, you have just as much right to step in and help somebody that's been overtaken in a fault as anybody else. It does have a bearing on the eldership of the church. I understand that. But I would never teach that in an exclusive manner. That it would just be the job of the elders to take care of somebody that was overtaken in a fault. No. You have just as much right to help that individual as the elders do, if there's elders. And, you know, I think these things that we talked about tonight, y'all, these things would improve our Christian living if we look at those and we install those into our lives in such a way that, you know, the next time some of these things happen to us and none of us are immune to these things that we talked about tonight, I think we can do a better job of being a Christian if we let some of these things filter into our brain and utilize them in our lives. Okay, that's all the time I have for us tonight. We'll have just a, a few moments to ring the bell and get our other constituents in.